<laughs> Thanks so much for joining us today. My pleasure. So I think some of the people in the audience may not know, but um, you come from a long line of entrepreneurs. Your mom was an entrepreneur and your grandmother was an entrepreneur. Um, did you know that you would, al did you always know that you would found a company, that you would continue in that direction? Actually, I didn't. Um, my husband was the one with the great desire to create something. I was escaping out of high tech um, because I thought raising a family and doing high tech 16 hours a day, rather do something else, which I did. And house just happened, so I was dragged back big time, 16 hours a day, to do it with him. But I'm very happy I did. So describe to me how you founded House, because like many great companies, iconic companies, it was founded because you wanted to solve a personal problem. Yes, so we wanted to renovate and design our house, and the tools to do it were in there. Um, so take me back to that situation. Where were you living? <laughs> What type of remodel were you doing? You had some children as well, right? We had two kids at the time. And um, yes, the house is in Palo Alto, very old ranch from 1955. And we wanted good professionals. We had big dreams, how fun it's going to be to renovate it. And it was That's a nightmare. The way that it was when a nightmare. They start their renovations Everything was bad in the process. There weren't tools to really educate ourselves. Um, to find good professionals, good inspiration, um, great product. The world was very narrow for us. Um, so we just created it for ourselves. And it started very, very locally in the Bay Area as a pet project. Um, we basically worked with designers and architects in the Bay Area and San Francisco. And the first homeowners on the site were our friends from the kids' school. They were also facing the similar, similar situation with you know, remodeling that wasn't fun. And it just took life of its own. It was a pet project. I mean, describe, I'm curious about that. How did you turn a pet project? Because I'm sure you know, many of the people in this audience have some of those pet projects that they work on on their spare time. How did you turn that into a real business? I mean, that, that's not an easy transition to make. When did you decide? this is actually going to be something that I focus on, quit my job, which you and your husband, your husband was at eBay. You were I was an in investment yeah, house. You were, uh, in finance. What, what was that transition like? For a long time, we didn't think doing it. It was a, a fun project. Um, we were very, very passionate about it. And we spent a lot of time, um, Alon coded the initial site by himself, and I was creating that community in the Bay Area, and it was great. Um, at some point, we just felt, whoa, it will be very hard to scale this. Um, and so somebody through our network introduced us to Oren Zev, and he was one of the best decisions we ever made. Um, he invested the first $2 million in the company, and that moment we said, okay, if we have a great partner that is willing to support us all the way and not ruin all the fun that we had, yeah, sure, let's do it. That was um, almost three years ago, and um, many things happened af um, after that. But I think bootstrapping, we didn't realize that we were bootstrapping at the time, became one of the best things that ever happened to us. Well, th that's an interesting point, because you're seeing a lot of entrepreneurs these days raise early on huge seed rounds. Um, you chose to stay a little bit smaller. You bootstrapped even before you raised. For a long time. Yeah, so why did you go that route? I think that um, in retro respect, looking at this, many times entrepreneurs spend the first six months or a year chasing investors. And I'm not talking about the serial entrepreneurs that go out there and then just get money because of who they are. I'm talking about most of us. They go out there, they create presentations, they go to investors, and then the investor tell them, hmm, the business model is not great, change the presentation here, do it there, go back, change it again. And this is really frustrating. Um, I would say today, instead of spending the first year doing that, why don't you spend creating a product that people would really need and love? And you know what happened after that? Investors will come to you. Because if you prove that you can execute and you have a great product that people need, that's it. I mean, investor will follow. I mean, 
you know, you had Sequoia come to you. Uh, tell me about that because you, you basically told Oren that you did not want to go to Sand Hill Road at all. You didn't even want to walk over there. We did. <laughs> so how did you get people to come to you? Oren um, tried to talk to us for uh, quite some time about, after he invested, about bringing top tier VC and how great it's going to be for the company to have a great name and a great help from one of these firms. And we kept saying, no, no, it's all about the individuals and we're having so much fun with you and it's the family style. And we and don't want that. Raise. No, we had a lot of, we had plenty of money. One of the beauties of, of doing um, a bootstrap company, you keep it very, very lean and you do it all by yourself and you just learn how to do it very efficiently. So we didn't need the money, but he really thought that a top tier VC would help a lot. So at one point we said, you know what, okay, we'll just have coffee or tea with very few individuals that we'll pick. And if we'll have the chemistry and if we'll think that they can be part of the family, maybe. Um, no commitment. So before we'll change our minds or and send a few emails, and the next morning after he sent very few emails, um, Mike Moritz and Alfred Lean came to the office. It was Monday morning, so we were flattered because we know that usually is the partner meetings. Um, so they came from Sequoia and they sat with us and we were sitting in a very, our first office was a very small open space, 11 people. So they were sitting with all of us and we showed them the product and what we have and you couldn't see anything on their face. They were just looking and asking stone questions. Face. Yeah, stone yeah. face. And we said, okay, you know, we showed them the product. Um, they knew a lot, both of them, about the industry. And then they asked them if we'd like to have some tea with them downstairs and said, sure. So Oren was with us, so the five of so us. At this point, had they given you any feedback? Had they reacted to the product? No, they asked questions, smart questions. They are smart people. But that was it. It was very casual, and that was the nature of the meeting. And then we had tea, and we continued the conversation. And an hour later, they were looking at them, you know, at each other, and they both said, "Okay, we would like to invest." All right. Um, it sounds easy, but they really made it easy for us. Two weeks after we had the money in the bank, we actually ended up raising more than we even thought, you know, that we're going to raise. Um, and what they are the best about partners. What Sequoia, though, that, you know, because I'm sure, you know, you've had others that were interested. What was it about Sequoia? You know, Doug was on here just a, a little bit ago talking about really focusing on the partner. Was it Alfred? Was it Michael? What, what was Both. It? We knew that Alfred is going to join the board, and we felt that his experience uh, coming from Zappos would be priceless. Um, he, they also proved to us that it's not about their ego. They are not going to force us to do things that we don't feel that we should do at this point. We are running the company in a very different way. It's a family style. Oren blended very well into that culture, and we felt that Alfred can do the same. Actually. Instead of forcing the founders to create tons of unnecessary presentations and financial reports, which at that point, I was also acting as the VP finance of the company, was terrible for me. They said, no, do what you need to do and we'll support you. So we'll sit at the back seat and whatever you need. And they did until today. Um, it was the best, the best decision we've made. We love our investors, and I'm not just saying that. We feel very, very fortunate. Sequoia is a great company, but it's all about the people. And I think that if people can get investors that really understand the founders, Alf Alfred was there. Um, he's very smart, but he's also, he knows. He knows what's important to us, whether it's um, talking to great engineers that are getting tons of offers from many companies and telling them why they should join house, and they do. Um, or sharing his wisdom about how they did things at Zappos and, and how we should apply that on house. We just love talking to him. No secretaries in the middle. It's just great. I want to switch gears a little bit to the business because um, from the outside looking in, house seems like a rocket ship. And I want to know, A, is that a, is that a combination of, you know, just a viral platform, you know, like a Pinterest-like platform, as well as some of the macro trends taking place in the real estate world? House is very deep into the home remodeling and design vertical. 
it's, it's the only destination that provides the end-to-end -end solution for both homeowners and professionals, architects, designers, contractors, um, that would like to engage with each other and, and create beautiful homes. I think that the fact that we are so focused in that vertical and we offer everything from inspiration, we have over two million um, high, high resolution photos contributed. That's, by that's actually up from 1.2 million uh, just a few months ago. Yes, it's, it's growing fast. We have a very engaged uh, professional community. We have over 250,000 of them active professionals across US and Canada now and they keep uploading thousands of new projects every day, um, which is great. They provide guides to the community and people can ask questions and, and educate themselves. We have reviews, people can find the best professionals for what they're trying to do. Over one million products and materials, the world is no longer just a few local stores and brands that you know. It's just the end-to-end -end solution in a vertical is very, very important when you're trying to make decisions, 5,000 of them a day, um, to remodel a house. And the professional, too, told us they love it that they can finally communicate with the homeowners because they felt people don't really know um, what to expect and they think they can get a lot for a very small budget and they don't know how to, write the, how to ask the right questions. And, so it's a great community that collaborate around this, this vertical. So you have consumers using your product. You also have professionals, so the design professionals, the contractors yeah. um, on the other side using. Uh, having a marketplace like that can be a tough, it can be a tough product because you have to serve your consumers and you also have to serve your professionals. And, Pierre Omajar, the founder of eBay, has, you know, he has some interesting views on this because he said you know, he focused on sellers because he thought the buyers would come on eBay. How do you rationalize that and what do you think about that? I think that you can't have the buyers without the sellers and you can't have the sellers without the buyers. For us, it was pretty much um, the same attitude from the beginning. We need everybody to be happy and, and we want everybody to collaborate uh, with each other. So the two small groups that we started with, a small group of architects and designers in the Bay Area grew to be 250,000 professionals because they feel very comfortable there with the homeowners, um, creating great discussions around different topics and, and talking to each other. Um, homeowners, the small group of our friends from school grew to be over 15 million people um, just on the side and under 10 million on the app. And they really enjoy the fact that the collaboration there works. Um, all what we had to do, which wasn't little, but is to create the right technology, to put the right tools in place, and let them talk to each other. I think it's very important, and we can't neglect any side of this marketplace. It's very important. Yeah, so I'm also, I'm also curious about monetization, because you recently started monetizing more. You know, you have a professional uh, platform that professionals use that they pay to use. What is, how's monetization going and what does that look like for you? It's going very well. Um, I think that for us, monetization was always after user experience and, and the product itself. And this is what helped the monetization a lot later on. Um, because you can't buy love, right? You, if you first have to create that product and, and experience that people really love and need, and then everything else follows. So once we decided to monetize and we already had that marketplace and the people there collaborating and talking to each other, people were actually happy to pay and get more. Um, we have a few channels today. The Pro Plus that you just mentioned is um, a local branding uh, capability that we uh, gave our professionals. The organic side remained free, um, but many of them told us that they would love a way to build their brands locally and they can target certain areas, especially if they're local. Exactly. So we launched it as a beta at the end of 2012 in 12 markets. And it was phenomenal. So and we, has that grown now? So much love. So, so yes, after, after they told us, yes, we vote for it, we love it, we're getting the analytics with it, we love the ability to communicate with our local people. Uh, we worked um, the entire first quarter of this year, and we launched it in 425 markets across US and Canada. So it's, 
again, we're working with our community and we are trying to create products that they need and, and want and love using. How big of an opportunity is international? So you're in Canada, but are you looking to expand to Europe and Asia and Latin America? So until now, the majority of our focus was US and Canada. 80% of our users, both professionals and homeowners, come from US and Canada. But we start, started seeing lots of demand coming from Europe and other Western countries. And you said someone from Dubai came over to use one of the yeah. uh, architects from LA, is that correct? That, that, was, that was pretty amazing because um, about a year ago, a reporter called me, he found a landscape designer from Newport, California, that was hired uh, by one of house users to um, do the landscape and patios and pools in Dubai. So they flew to, and this is a small firm, five people from Newport Beach, California. And they called me to ask, uh, is that an extreme situation? And I said, well, you know, we hear a lot about people traveling from state to state here in the US, but this, I would say, pretty extreme. Um, nice to hear but pretty extreme. And then he published the article and we started getting emails from other professionals telling us, well, it's not extreme. I'm an architect from Florida and I just came back from Australia and another one got a job in Cyprus and New Zealand. So I said, okay, this is great, efficient market. Um, so yes, and we do see the international demand and we are, stay tuned because we do have some plans on that front as well. Okay, uh, what are those plans? Expanding. <laughs> uh, so I want to switch gears a little bit to Zillow mm -hmm. because they launched basically a copycat of what you have earlier this year. It's called Digs. Mm -hmm. How did that make you feel? You want the real <laughs> truth yeah. about it? Yeah. I would be worried if by now we wouldn't have all these copycats. I think it's a great validation for what we do and for this industry that really needed uh, great tools to disrupt the industry. Um, great leaders and great companies come from innovation and this is what we are doing. Copycats will come and go and this is fine. We really, we are really focused on what we do and um, we really believe in what we do. It's very, very tailored for this industry and for this vertical. Tell me about the culture at House because you, you've talked a lot about a flat organization and that was very purposeful in the way that you designed the company and structured the company. What does that mean? What is a, what is a flat organization? Yeah, so many people use this flat organization uh, um, buzzword, but for us it meant we wanted partners, not employees. We wanted people that will come and innovate with us um, we wanted the best engineers that we can have in the Valley. Um, and for that, we thought, okay, they need the right environment around them in order to create. And it probably means no middle management, um, no bureaucracy, not tons of meetings and paperwork and um, long way to approve what they think they should do. Just let them innovate like we do with us. Um, so we started with a few top-notch engineers and designers and it worked really well. Um, people came from big internet companies and where they were managers and directors. So does everyone have the same title? Is it yes, just titles are not important. They can pick whatever title they want. No offices. No offices. We all work in one big open space. They all work directly with Alain that is in charge of the product and technology. And they can innovate all the way from the high concept and all the way, executing it and seeing it really fast. And they are serving millions of people. And how many employees do you have now? 120. And have you had anyone leave? None of the engineers left. <laughs> <laughs> they, I, and I think, again, it's, it's about being happy. It's so hard. This is really hard, running a company like this. Um, for all of us, you have good days, you have bad days. But if you have great people around you to work with, it makes it a lot of fun. So if I have to work 16 hours a day again, I have to do it with people I truly love. And I do love the people in the company and apparently they are, they are happy there too. Well, you mentioned you know, running a company is really hard. I would say the second or maybe first hardest work is, is marriage. And you happen to be uh, you know, married to your co-founder. 
How do you manage that? I know that I would never be able to start a company with my husband. <laughs> never. Um, Alon is always joking about it's way easier to run the company with me than renovating the house with me. And he's probably right. Um, but truly, I think that the fact that we know each other so well, we've been together for 18 years, some of the other issues that uh, founders may face, like trust issues or conflict of interest, um, not wanting the same path for the company, does not exist. Um, we build things together, we create things together, we have two wonderful kids that we created together, we do the company together. It works well for us, and I think the fact that we are in charge of different sides of, of the business also helps, but then we're good friends. How do you balance the work and the life? I mean, you have two kids, you have a husband who's, you know, of course your coworker as well, got another one on the way. Um, how do you find that balance? Do you have time to yourself? I do the things that I enjoy the most, which is being with my family and running house. And of course, it's a matter of priorities. And we've made a decision that we want to do both. So you have to give up other things. Um, but it makes us better people. I think when, when you are a parent, when, because I'm a mom, it, it forces me to focus both at home and at work on the thing that really matters. Um, and it works. Do you take time on the weekend or the evening and just say, I'm off? You're never really off because house is always like a child. It's always in your, the company is always in your mind. But there are definitely times that we are with the kids and times that we're in the company. Weekends are for the kids and we're always on call. People can always find us. Um, you learn to balance it. It's healthy. It's good. Well, um, I, have, I want to end, we don't have very much time left, but I want to end with any advice that you may have for some of the entrepreneurs who are considering turning their pet projects into you know, a startup. Do you have uh, any sort of parting words of wisdom? Well, I truly think, we talked about it, that the bootstrap stripping route is, is something that people should consider. Um, being able to later on get the best investors because of that and making conscious decision um, is, is really helpful. And also, it's okay to start with growing the traffic and getting the traction, but don't be afraid to put a real business engine behind your companies. Because sometimes you see internet companies and they say, yes, and once we'll start monetizing, this is how much we're gonna make. Forget it, do it. Um, it's not easy, but it's so worth it. This is money is great and it's very helpful to scale at the beginning, but having a real business behind your company is priceless. So don't be afraid to do it. That's great, great advice. Thank and you. love, love, love what you do. It's important. That's great. Thank you so much, Adi. Thank you for having me.